number of transgender people seeking medical help is exploding. Some are only seven years old, a few are already 70. The demand for surgeries is increasing, and on TV and the internet, we mainly see transgender people who are happy. All I see are celebration stories about how beautiful such a world as transgender is. It's just everything. It's, yes, I'm much happier, absolutely. But for some people, the operation destroyed their lives. I know that there are people who regret it. Patrick Devine tells his story for the first time. I am just 1,000% sure I am a gay man. Well, this is a disaster what happened to me. Zembla investigates. Who is eligible for gender reassignment surgery? You're trans? Yes, good for you. You couldn't tell? No. Well, I'm trans. Nice. All the coverage we've had over the past years were celebration, celebration stories. Look how nice and beautiful. While you don't get the group of people in front of the camera who are wasting away at home behind closed doors, Professor Just Acampo is concerned about the group of trans people who do not want to be in the spotlight. His first experience with this was about 20 years ago. I encountered a patient who was clearly psychotic, and I noticed that they had a high-pitched voice. It was a man with a high-pitched voice, breast augmentation, and it turned out to be someone who had been taking hormone treatments for six years for gender transition and I diagnosed paranoid psychosis and treated the patient. The patient later said, I now look at my life differently and I think that my decision to change gender was a delusion that I no longer believe in. Acampo wanted to know if this was common and in 2000 did a survey of Dutch psychiatrists. We then received around 86 responses from psychiatrists, and they reported on, I think, 586 patients they knew with a desire for gender reassignment, whereby they found that half of those patients actually had another problem that primarily needed attention. So there was a huge overlap with other psychiatric problems. Just Acampo received a lot of criticism after the publication of his study. He even received threatening letters. It seemed to some that I had something against these people, but I am just a concerned citizen psychiatrist who just started to investigate some surprising findings, who wanted to draw attention to that without bias, and then was denounced as some caveman blocking modern trends. And that's not true. I stand up for the vulnerable. We are going to Emmen, where we meet Patrick Devine. He was born 40 years ago, a boy. Later, he developed the desire to become a woman. Why do you want to become a woman? Why do you think you would be happier in another body? I don't know that myself we get access to his complete file. In 1998, he first visited the University Medical Center in Groningen to talk about sex reassignment treatment. In 1999, I dropped out quite quickly because I didn't dare. I didn't dare. Not for the outside world. Not for my family. I didn't dare. But the desire to be a woman did not go away. I was already having an identity crisis, and then I ended up on a web forum for trans people. And there, I just read all the celebration stories about how well everything went and how beautiful such a world as transgender or transsexual is. Then I thought, maybe I suffer from the same thing, but not from an early age. 
In 2006, Patrick again goes to the gender clinic. After three conversations with a psychiatrist, he's given the green light for taking female hormones. As part of the screening, he has to present himself publicly as a woman from that moment on. This is called the real life period. I had a whole wardrobe. Clothes, shoes, nice jewelry. I looked quite successful. Only, I didn't feel happy about it. I also had great fears. I have that in the real life phase. I've not been outside often. Patrick informs his therapist in Groningen that he finds it difficult to appear in public as a woman. He says, surely that's not a reason to cancel the operation. To me, the alarm bells should have started ringing, but to such a doctor, even more. In March 2008, Patrick received a referral letter stating that he has successfully completed his real life period. He's ready for his surgery. Actually quite cheerful, nervous too that day. I thought, soon the gates will open for me. In June 2008, Patrick had his gender reassignment surgery. Patrick now calls himself Patricia. Here you don't see any beard shadow or beard growth, no, nothing. No, no. Your makeup was always very nice, very nice and not overdone, no. Such a shame, such a beautiful bunch of hair. Well, you had such beautiful hair. A few months after that operation, I fell into a very deep pit, realizing what happened to me, yes. And that something like this should never happen again that it was irreversible and that I had to learn to live with it. You regretted it? Yes, I regretted it. It, it doesn't belong to me, no. Every day I feel like this. Oh, take this away from me. Take it away from me. When I take a shower, a towel goes in front of the mirror because I don't want to see. We review with psychiatrist Gert Baker the interview footage of Patrick, who's been in therapy with Patrick for six years. Patrick has given him permission to talk about his file. He has a borderline personality disorder, addiction problems, PTSD. There are many side problems. All those things you mentioned now, did he have that before? Yes. What went wrong here? I don't think that it was made clear enough that it was his fantasy or a delusion to want to be a woman, but that there is no element of gender dysphoria. But he has had several psychiatrists evaluate him in Groningen, yes? Couldn't they figure that out? Apparently not. I think there should have been more conversations with him, really connect with him to help him really put into words what lives in him, lived so that people could also see that there was no real question of gender dysphoria. Not from childhood to have the feeling, I am in the wrong body. The 22-year-old Thierry van Kesteren from Amsterdam already knows at a young age that something is not right. He was born a girl and will soon have surgery. From taking male hormones, he already has a low voice. Mostly, I was very bothered the way my body was, and that suffocates you in a way without actually suffocating you. But it's like being trapped. But you don't have bars around you, but your skin is the bars. Of course, I want to get rid of that. As soon as possible, because that is no fun. Mom, I recently found my old voice recording from the first day. Today is 15 August 2017. I just had my first shot of testosterone. Geez, Tiori, so different. What a difference. Yes. I don't recognize your voice anymore either. No? No. Oh, how nice. Oh, how great. Tiori started a year and a half ago with his transition. From that moment on, he also wanted to be seen by everyone and to be addressed as a man. For my work, I've put a short piece online on the intranet because everyone needs to know. Then I immediately received emails from skippers and people who are on social media or face-to-face, -face, 
Everyone was very positive. Very sweet. Why did you feel it necessary that everyone knew? Well, because I want people to call me he and Tiori, what my name has been ever since. To hear my old name or something, that just hurt a lot, and then you're still not seen for who you are. That she and the old name is a little thing that, in a certain way, was murdering me. Between 1972 and 2015 in the VU Medical Center, more than 5,000 gender reassignment operations were performed. The VU treats by far most transgender people in the Netherlands. The number of registrations has exploded in recent years. In 2008, the VU had about 200 new intakes. In 2015, there were more than 700. We contacted Doreen Selenrad, who worked between 2000 and 2001 as a clinical psychologist at the gender team of the VU. It was a very intensive period for me because I couldn't quite agree with the policy as it was conducted there. I found a kind of atmosphere rule of too much going along with the wishes of the patient, and that against a background of compassion and mercy. Those words sometimes were used, but what I was missing was critical judgment with regard to diagnostics and indications. Sullenrod noticed that in her time there, there was a lot of mutual contact between patients. That makes it more difficult for her to make the correct diagnosis. There was talk about what you had to say to get the diagnosis. There was talk about which psychologists were more difficult and which were less difficult. I was one that was difficult. I was one that a patient once said to me, gosh, it was easier in the past. I think you are making it very difficult. Doreen Selenrod thought it was irresponsible to continue like that and drew up an improvement plan. I proposed a different diagnostic protocol, stricter criteria for making the diagnosis, and for indicating a sex reassignment treatment. But most people said, it's too complex of a matter. You cannot define exactly what the criteria are. You may therefore miss people who would wrongly not receive treatment. So we say, let's not change it and keep it as it is. I thought, I can no longer be responsible as a fellow member of the team. And it was because of this that I had to leave. The VU Medical Center did not want to respond to the criticism from Selenrad, and also didn't respond when asked how things are run currently. We asked about the experience of Thierry, who is now being treated. I think you have at least four conversations with a psychologist. I had four. But if the psychologist thinks you should have more, you have more. How much time was there between the different conversations? Normally, it's a month, I believe. Between every call? Yes. But she had more consultation time with me. So then I had it every a week and a half or so. So I was very lucky. I had my first and last talk, all of them, in exactly one month. So in a month and four conversations, it was clear. Yes. What exactly will happen if you are going to have surgery? I'm doing the combination operation. One is for the flat chest, and they also do hysterectomies. So then I'm out of that. In addition to conversations, it is customary for all patients to undergo a psychological test. I didn't have that because I would, because after four conversations, it was super clear. Otherwise, I would have had to wait for another month and a half just for that psychological test. And then after that, at the meeting, and then through a mill, and then it would be, I don't know, months later before I'm ready for, yes, nothing. I assume that as a psychologist, you also know what I've learned in how people, how, how to figure things out. So if there's nothing to fish out, then you can be ready quickly, I think. 
In 2002, a controversial paper interview with Professor Acampo about the presence of underlying psychiatric disorders in a portion of the transgender group produced a response by the healthcare inspectorate. The inspectorate asked the Dutch Association for Psychiatry to formulate clear criteria for indications for sex reassignment procedures. On that basis, I received an invitation from the board to participate in the working group for transsexual operations. That's what it was called. And then it went quiet. That working group has never met. Acampo came up with his own proposal. Couldn't they appoint an independent review committee to it? Who could formalize a second opinion with the review committee? Why does that not happen while much lesser things are appointed review committees? We want to know whether there are criteria yet. The inspectorate refers us to the professional group. It points us to this quality standard. However, it says, there is currently no consensus on how to best shape the indications for gender-affirming therapy. More than 16 years later, psychiatrists still disagree on how to determine whether someone can undergo sex reassignment surgery. I'll have a croissant. Patrick has been living with Theo de Haas since he was 17. Theo is his support and rock. In 2010, they asked the UMC Groningen for his medical file. We're terrified. It says, there is no diagnosis of transsexuality. That is stated in a letter dated October 25, 1999, and I'm very angry about that because that announcement we never had. In 1999, the medical team in Groningen therefore established that there is no diagnosis of transsexuality with Patrick, but he was never told, Patrick says. That I later request my file and that I must read that I am not transsexual, at least they should have told me, because I could turn my back and go home, because it's not that. W with this on the paper, how do you give the green light? We asked UMC Groningen for a response. For privacy reasons, they do not want to comment on the file, even though Patrick has given permission to do so. The hospital does not want to respond on camera, but writes to us that regret is very rare. Worldwide, although rare, it is a concern. At our request, and with Patrick's permission, medical ethicist Theo Burr reviews his file. If you consider that he's already had an intake in the late 1990s, and then it was determined that he has no gender problem, then he comes back eight years later, and then, almost without much more assessment, the transition process goes forward. And I feel that both the gender team, but also Patrick himself, went full steam ahead, as it were, on sex reassignment surgery. That it is not just the fault of one party, it is perhaps the tragedy of the interplay of those two parties. We read in the file that the psychiatrist in Groningen, Patrick's desire for gender reassignment was persistent. I think it resulted from the confusion created He created so much noise around him that it clouds the issue, so that he ends up confusing them, including himself. Gert Becker, who as a psychiatrist also diagnoses people with gender dysphoria, more often sees that patients do everything to convince the doctor of their desire for gender reassignment. Patients know very well how to present themselves to achieve their goal. What are the important things to say? to insist that you want gender reassignment surgery, say that you've always had that wish since childhood or that you feel you are in the wrong body. It's dangerous at the same time that I say this now and that it's broadcast on TV. But still, that happens because the knowledge is very large within that group because they are on the internet a lot. 
Transgender Brald Haak is admin of a Facebook page where transgender people meet to connect. He notices that people do not always inform each other honestly and sometimes only show the bright parts. There are, of course, among themselves, all sorts of stories going around. I had the operation, so that makes me so happy. It all works so wonderfully. But, of course, there's a bit of bias in it. For example... If someone, suppose someone has been saving for 10 years for a beautiful car, finally bought it, driving it around, and it is actually a bit disappointing, but you ask him about it, what will he say then? That he has saved for 10 years for nothing and that it's disappointing? No, of course, he says this, it's the most beautiful thing I've ever bought. It all seemed nice, but I never knew what kind of misery is going on in that world. Sometimes I see it more as some kind of cult, that they talk to each other. There will undoubtedly be success stories, but also a lot of things that end poorly. I think there are a lot of people who have gone through this process, that there are many people who regret it. But they retreat. They're no longer visible. You don't hear from them. Why do you think there are many people who regret this operation? Well, I don't think there are. I know there are. There are people who regret it. 85% of transgender patients are treated by the VU Medical Center. Our own research shows that less than 1% of patients regret the operation. But the point is, that about one-third of the patients do not follow up afterwards and have no further contact to speak with the clinic. There is great reason to believe that this third of the patients has a large number of regretters. People who want nothing more to do with the gender team. I will make an effort to find them anyway. And I have a few letters from parents who say, We just lost our son. He may have taken his own life or may have gone under the radar somewhere. But things are not going well. We don't know. So it may be that there are very big dramas under the radar and we only see report of the successes. What are the VU's interests? Well, I think if this is your product, you do everything to keep that product in the window looking as beautiful as possible. But is there a financial motivation? I don't know. I can't say. But it is not cheap. If you have to provide lifelong hormone treatments and do surgeries and another surgery correction and again, and you still have to do so and so. So it involves a lot of people who all have a role in it, including the ones who do laser treatments to remove hair from unwanted places and everything in between including speech therapists and the clothing consultant. This is part of what remains of my wardrobe. I don't know if I'll ever wear it again, although there are many nice things here. Good memories. Braldhawk has had to stop his transition to woman last September. During the time on hormones, I had gained about 30 kilos. I already had some cardiac arrhythmias, and it became very black and white because of my health. Do I want to live on as a man or be dead as a woman? Earlier this year, I was interviewed by the Stentor because it was unique that there was a transgender candidate for the VVD on the list for city council. In the beginning of my transition, I had no hormones, and yet I wore a dress, I walked in heels, despite all my masculine characteristics. Looking back on that, I think how incredibly brave it was that I did that. I walk outside, shoulders back, chest forward, and world, here I am. Yes, maybe I used to be a man, but I'm also someone who wants to be happy, as we all want to be happy. That's a bit of self-confidence that you need as a transgender because there's a lot to come at you. 
The probability of happiness after the transition also depends on how credible you look to the outside world as a trans woman. It turned out to be difficult for Patrick to mask his masculine features. I tried it anyway. I've been looking for volunteer work. Nearby here, I would take elderly people to the hairdresser and to other things. But then the woman said to me, there's a chance that there are people who do not want to be helped by you. That's what she said to me. I was allowed to staple folders somewhere in the corner of the building. Did that affect you? Yes, I felt sad. You just weren't accepted. We made contact with the 82-year-old Corinne Van Tongerloo. Fifty years ago, she underwent one of the first transgender operations in Casablanca in Morocco. For years, she was able to keep it a secret. I didn't have an Adam's apple. I had a girl's voice. I looked very good, so I could live very discreetly. You also have people who are physically not very feminine. Is that a problem? That is a problem. Because they must also be able to live a life, lead a female life. That was no problem with Corinne. Her transition did not hinder relationships with heterosexual men. If I met a man, I wouldn't say it right away. I had the great advantage that you didn't see it in me. I flirted. I didn't immediately go to the first time with someone. But if a sexual relationship did result, then I didn't want him to... They were allowed to touch my breasts. They were allowed to make love, but they were not allowed below. That was hidden. So that was always a problem. And then they would say, when are we actually going to have sex? You are so prudish. And then I would say, yes, I have a problem. And then I would tell them, I have a big problem because I used to be a boy. And either they were scared to death and ran away, or because I was beautiful and sweet with them, they were in love and then it continued. This is how I built my relationships. I've been in relationships for six years, for seven years. Korean realizes very well that there are also transgender people who lead a less happy life. Sometimes they can't get a partner. There are a lot of things that make it difficult sometimes. Sometimes there is depression. There are trans people who are unhappy and who are very... Yes, that end badly. Terrible. I think that's so awful. According to a Swedish study, transgender people have a higher risk of suicide than non-transgender people, even after surgery. I think if you're not strong in your shoes and are burdened with other psychiatric problems, that you would do well to work on your other problems first. First, make sure you are strong enough to handle transition and then you can do transition. But if you enter transition while you're still dealing with depression, anxiety, and other things, if you are very insecure, for example, then such a gender transition is very heavy. And maybe that is one aspect that comes into play in people who regret or even commit suicide after transition. Transition doesn't help to solve the problems they already had. Ms. Van Tongerloo has known several trans women with whom it did not end well. One of them was Catherine, who was very dear to her. When I turned 60, I happened to meet a young transgender as a boy first, and that became a relationship like a mother-daughter relationship. And that was fantastic. That made me very happy. But unfortunately, it also ended very tragically. She committed suicide. Because she didn't sit well in her skin, she also had depression from an early age. That's Catherine as Cedric, 16 years old, I think, with a dog I never knew. When Cedric started transition, he was in a homosexual relationship with Herman. Herman is gay. He was sad that Cedric was going to be Catherine, because there was no stopping it. Ever since she saw me, everything had to go fast. Catherine had become a woman, a very beautiful woman. They stayed together for a while, but that didn't work. 
And he said, I love guys, you know that. We can stay friends, but I can't go on. I long for a boy. She had already sent a message. She had hung her Christmas tree upside down. That's that awful staircase that she went up where she did it, her suicide. Patrick is so unhappy as a woman that after three years, he decides to go through life as a man again. I always came to Marjoline for my nails. She said to me, too, because I always sat with her crying because I regretted it so much. But that's where I just came as Patricia for the nails. She at one point said, Well, you know what? We'll cut your hair, buy other clothes, and off you go. Just live like a man again. But that didn't make me happy, no. You can never completely be yourself again. And I have severe discomfort on the abdomen and on the bladder all the time. Pain? Yes. After years of therapy, Patrick has now become hopeless and has been diagnosed with severe depression. He's been approved for euthanasia. His psychiatrist, Gert Baker, wants to help him with this. I can see that you are suffering terribly. I can imagine it is unbearable for you. And then I submitted the application to the Sken doctor, support and consultation for euthanasia in Netherlands, and the doctor agreed. And then we got the green light. If I were to say to Gert, Gert, I want to end my life, he will help me. Only that too is a very big step, and that too is irreversible. Ethicist Theo Burr has been a member of the Regional Euthanasia Review Committee for many years, and also looked at Patrick's case with that perspective. In this case, the assessment committee has the duty to examine if the hopelessness of suffering has been looked at. One of the things you then look at immediately is, surgically speaking, is there anything left that could be done about this misery? There is no clinic in the Netherlands where repair operations are performed. But in Serbia, Professor Miroslav Djordjevic specializes in transgender reversal operations. In recent years, he has operated on 14 regret patients. In the meantime, 60 new patients have registered with him. Are there any cases from Holland? I cannot tell you. Sorry. If you have a male who uh, passed transition, wrong transition, and who has now regret, uh, we have to create, a, uh, again, male genitalia. And for this reason, we have to find a good and enough material to create a neophallus, scrotums, and testicles. So, for example, for phalloplasty, we use a piece of uh, uh, arm or of the back or the leg to create a neophallus. After that, we use uh, some uh, uh, different tissue, for example, oral mucosa or uh, bladder mucosa or maybe some other parts of the skin to create a very long urethral channel. And also we use some implants, like a penile implants, to enable uh, erection after reconstruction of the neophallus, also testicular implants. Multiple operations are required to complete the recovery. The entire process can take up to one and a half years. However, no genitals can be reconstructed yet, with which patients can have a satisfying sex life again. And for this reason, we started to research about possibility for penile transplant surgery. It means if we have, for example, 1.5 million transgender persons in Western Europe registered, we have almost half and half male to female, female to male. If we have 700,000 male to female, we are going during a surgery to cut, to remove 700,000 penises and to put in the garbage. So my life, my life uh, motto, my uh, biggest uh, vision is to collect all, all organs, to save the organs, not to put to the garbage, uterus, ovaries, testicles, penises, and then collect this, create a bank in Europe, and then use some of these organs for better results, for better functioning, to help the, another person who really needs this. 
For Patrick Devine, this does not seem like a solution. He doesn't dare. But I don't know how it will be in a year or in two years. But now he's not ready for that. <laughs>